So my name is Orzuk. I'm uh, at the Hebrew University at the Statistics and Data Science Department. And I'm going to talk to you about embryo selection. Uh, now the title, well, it's, it's talking about m selection for multiple disease and traits. Uh, the talk will be a little bit different, so I will sort of give more an introduction to embryo selection. So a lot of, you know, a, 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 a large part of the talk will, talk, will, will consider a single trait, but then there will also be parts that will consider multiple traits. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's start. So that's the outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to start by giving a background. What is embryo selection? And especially for complex traits and using polygenic scores. Um, then I will talk about our modeling and results for quantitative traits. And then the last part will be about uh, disease traits. And for both the second and the, and the last part, uh, we'll, have, we'll start with one trait, which is simpler, and then we'll move to multiple traits, which is more complicated. All right, so let's start. So uh, I'll give a bit of a background about embryo selection and then, you know, polygenic risk scores and GWAS, I guess you all heard enough about that. So I will try to move uh, fast and skip some things. So what is, why, is, why, why embryo screening? So traditionally, uh, uh, people have done embryo screening mainly for rare recessive diseases. So if you have uh, two parents and they are both carrier of some harmful allele for a recessive disease, then with probability one over four, their child will, will be affected by the disease. And then this gives us the motivation to screen the embryos. If you can test for a particular genetic marker for this uh, embryo, you can tell whether or not the embryo carries the disease or not. And then you want to select one that does not carry the disease, so you have a healthy uh, offspring. Um, so that's been traditionally done. And so, uh, in some places, like in Israel or other countries, and you can screen things like Tizax, or maybe families with uh, BRCA genes, or uh, Down syndrome, and others. Now, when we are looking at embryos, so we're talking about in vitro fertilization. Uh, and in, the, in this uh, uh, procedure, we typically have a few embryos available uh, because uh, again, the number of egg, egg cells from, from the female is uh, limited. Uh, so at the best, we are talking about, let's say, five or maybe a little bit more viable embryos. And then we want to... Uh, the physician wants to take one of them and implant it in the uterus. Uh, sometimes they take more than one, but uh, today it's usually one. And the question is which one to take, right? So that's, that's the issue in embryo selection. And, and uh, yeah, the field is also called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, and like I said, the one, you, 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 we want to choose the embryo by some criteria. Um, so how is it done? So you can you grow the embryo for three to five days. And then what's, what's been done today in the clinic is actually people are looking at morphological features of the embryo. So it could be imaging or some other uh, SIs. And the, the main criteria people are using today is they want to select the embryo such that it will maximize the likelihood that this embryo will develop into a viable, uh, a viable uh, fetus and a baby, yeah? so it will have la labor. Because uh, the success rate is not very high, so it's very important to choose the embryo to maximize the chance of this uh, procedure being successful. But uh, that's just, you know, about maximizing probability of success of, uh, of labor. But uh, like I said, uh, you can also select for other things, for minimizing risk, for example, for certain genetic diseases. Uh, and while this was done previously for monogenic diseases, rare diseases, nowadays the technology makes it possible, at least in principle, to also screen for a complex disease. Right? So 
The idea is very simple, and the technology today enables you to do that. Uh, if you extract DNA, you can not just test for BRCA or for Tysax or for other genes, but you can sequence the entire, um, the entire uh, genome, and then you can calculate polygenic scores. Now, there are many, many technical issues that, yeah, it's not that easy what I'm saying, but well, I'm not going to go into them uh, in this talk, uh, but rather we're going to be more uh, looking at these things a little bit more theoretically and assume that we can get a polygenic score from these embryos. Now, in principle, this can be done, and it's even done some, in some places in practice, but I, I should just say that it's a very, very controversial field, right? Uh, uh, selecting for embryos based on, uh, based on uh, some... Uh, based on some genetic scores. So the, we will talk a little bit about uh, ethics here. Uh, although this is not sort of uh, the main thing I'm doing, but, but many other people are uh, looking at the ethical issues of uh, embryo selection. And there are many, you know, of course, there are many, there are many people who are more like uh, bullish about that, but many are more cautious and say that you shouldn't do it. So just take into consideration, it's a quite controversial topic. All right, so let me be even, uh, you know, raise sort of the level of controversy. So in statistics, uh, we have this saying by Ronald Fisher that, you know, calling the statistician after the experiment was done, it's too late, right? Because you, what you really want to do is involve the statistician when you are doing ex experiment design, right? So you can be, you know, follow the same spirit and say, okay, what are we all doing here in the genomics community? A lot of the genomic community is driven by, the research is driven by medical applications, right? And why is that? Because, you know, genetic um, variation may make us susceptible to certain diseases, right? But in some sense, maybe it's too late, right? If we already have a variant that exposes us to certain harmful diseases, it might have been better, perhaps, to sort of avoid those from, from the first place, right? Okay. So, like I said, so we're talking about selecting for complex phenotypes using uh, polygenic scores. Um, and, you know, so, like I said, you can raise many, many ethical considerations, but in reality, once you have a technology, even if you don't like that, it's very likely that other people are going to do that. And uh, there is a, already a company in uh, the U.S., it's called Genomic Prediction, that offers this as a service, right? So if a couple wants to do IVF, uh, they can uh, pay and then have their, uh, the genome of the embryo uh, sequenced and have polygenic scores, and these, uh, the, you can select embryo based on these scores. Um, okay, so that's just from the website. They're screened for all kinds of diseases. Um, and they have uh, papers that, uh, you know, advertise their uh, service. All right, so, like I said, lots of ethical concerns, lots of, uh, you know, big uh, uh, publicity in, in the main media. Um, but and the, there's a lot of debate, and uh, you know there, there are all the all these uh, um, nightmare scenarios like Gattaca. I don't know if like my generation we we watched this movie. I don't know if the younger people here in the audience uh, heard about this movie. Yeah, I really recommend. Um, so there's a controversy and debate, like I said. But what we wanted to do is sort of uh, try to evaluate quantitatively the benefits and risk of embryo selection. We are not trying to take a position for or against, or when should you or when should you not do that. But what we are trying to do is trying to model this, this thing mathematically and give numbers, right? And then let other people argue, but let them argue while they have the correct numbers or at least some estimates, and not just, you know, argue uh, without any data. All right. So that's the goal of, of this line of work that, I, that me and my collaborators are doing. Um, so the first thing you want to ask is, does it even work? Of course, if it's not effective, you don't really want to use it, right? Um, so that will be the uh, first uh, project or first paper I'm going to present. Uh, we're going to look at the quantitative trait and polygenic scores and 
try to evaluate how much really can you gain with the current technology or the current accuracy of polygenic scores uh, when you're doing embryo selection. All right, so now I hope, again, yeah, this is sort of the background and I will dive more deeply into the technical details, right? So uh, we have, uh, we all know uh, we have GWAS, right? okay, so what, so what do we do in GWAS? We have a cohort, uh, they have their genotypes and then they have the phenotypes. And what is the output of GWAS? It, it gives us a polygenic scores. I mean, it gives us other things too, but also genome-wide significant hits. But one important output is the polygenic score. So it's a predictor. Here, you can see my mouse, right? So we have here a, a bunch of uh, SNPs, right? From J equals one to M. It doesn't have to be all SNPs. It can be a subset of them. And we have beta hat, their coefficients, right? And this is a predictor for, a, for a, a genome, right? So if you have a genome, you, have, you know all the excess, the values of the SNPs, and you multiply them by the beta hat, and you get a predictor for the phenotype, right? So that's a polygenic score. Uh, all right, and you can, I mean, there's, there's tons of literature about how do you go, are you going to fit these things. You can fit them marginally, or you can do lasso or other things. Uh, but we sort of take them as already ready for us, and there is maybe many of you know there's even a website, it's called the Polygenic Score Catalog, where you can download this, uh, this uh, beta hat coefficient, and if you have your own uh, genome, uh, you can, or, uh, you can uh, just plug in and, and, get this, and get the score. Right. Um, now we do some statistical modeling, so uh, uh, traditionally, for quantitative traits, we model y, the phenotype, as the sum of the genotype part and environmental part. And if you normalize the variance, then, then y has variance 1. The heritability is h squared. That's a proportion of variance explained by the genetic part. And 1 minus the heritability is a proportion of variance explained by the environment. Yeah, it's right here. All right. Now, when we will have the scores, I, I, will, I will define it shortly, but notice that we will have another quantity, which is what is the proportion of variance that is explained by the score, right? So it will not be the heritability. It will be something, let's see, let's see lower or higher, right? Anybody? Right, so again, so heritability is the proportion of variance explained by genetics. But when we have a score fitted from data, it will explain some part of the variance, and it will typically be lower than the heritability. Exactly. Right, because we have, a, we have estimation error from finite samples. Man, maybe the technology doesn't cover all the variance. Let's say you're using a SNP chip, so you're missing all the rare variance. So you will have some predictive power here, but it will typically be lower and maybe much lower than the heritability. All right, and that's what's written above there. So we'll, we'll denote it by R square PS, polygenic score, and that's smaller than H square SNP, that, which is not very important for our talk, but that's sort of the heritability you can explain with, rare var with a common variant. That's what uh, is available on chips today, and that's upper bounded by the heritability, and that's at most one. All right, now we will when we'll have embryo i, we'll denote the score by si. And this is just to give you some numbers. So for some uh, quantitative traits here, this is the heritability values. And these are the uh, r square explained by the current polygenic scores. Right? So they are lower, but as uh, from year to year, as, as people are increasing the sample sizes for GWAS and also improving the statistical method, these things are gradually growing. Right? Okay, and you know, so the, the upper bound is that. So we'll never, we'll never be able to, to, to go above that. Is that clear? Right. Okay, so now that's sort of a background and now we're gonna uh, model the polygenic scores of the embryos and ask, well, suppose that you have a few embryos and you select the one that maximizes the score, 
how will it affect the phenotype of the uh, offspring? Okay, so what? So for 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 most of the of the talk, we will in, assume what's called the infinitesimal model. So before before a couple of slides, I told you that the polygenic score is the sum of beta j x i j. But let's say, let's assume that there are many 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 x i j and many many beta j, and none of them is really very very high, right? So we have a contribution from many many small parts. And we all know that when you sum up a contribution of many, many small parts, if they are independent or even close to independent, you have the central limit theorem, and the sum uh, can be approximated by a Gaussian, by the normal distribution. So, if we have n embryos from the same family, we can even model their joint distribution as a multivariate normal, uh, and we normalize everything such that the mean is zero. But we also have a covariance matrix, sigma. Uh, now, how does this covariance matrix look? Like, so it has the variance of the trait here, and then it has what we've shown before. That's R squared PS, it's a very important parameter that tells you the proportion of variance explained by the score, right? The numbers I showed you before in the table. And what sigma S? Sigma S is a, the genetic similarity matrix for the embryos. Right? So, the embryos, you can think of them genetically as uh, siblings, right? They're, they all inherit their genetic material from uh, the same parents. But just like, you know, uh, brothers and sisters, they are not identical in their genomes. They only share part of their genome. The same is true also for embryos. And we know that they share, on average, half their genome, right? So, yeah, so if you, I don't know, for those of you who didn't know, if you, if you, if you take your genome and your uh, sibling, then on average, half of it will be identical. And if you look at, uh, let's say, yourself and your cousin, it will be lower. And there are, there are uh, certain rules in quantitative genetics that relate the familial relationship to the par part of the genome that is shared by two individuals. All right, so for siblings, it's one half. So, we have this covariance matrix, so on the, on the diagonal we have one because you share all your genome with yourself. And then, of the off-diagonal, you're not independent, you share half your genome, but the other half is independent. So, mathematically, we have this multivariate Gaussian uh, distribution. And now imagine that you take the maximum of this S1, S2, Sn. And remember that this does not give you the value of the trait. For the trait, you need to also add another component that is not captured by the score, right? And the question is, okay, how much will I gain? So, suppose that I take the embryo with the maximal S and I compare it to a random embryo, what will be on average the increase in the value of Y, the value of the trait? That's a, the first mathematical question we're going to ask. Is that clear? All right. Okay. So, that's what we written here. So, G will be what we call the gain. So, it's a maximum of the score minus sort of an average. And we take the, this is a random variable, we take the expectation, and that's what we're going to calculate. Now, I told you that we also have the, the non-score part, right, this epsilon. So, why doesn't it appear here? Well, it doesn't appear because in the expectation, it cancels out, right? It doesn't matter if you take an embryo you selected or a random embryo, you select only based on the score. So all the non-score components, at least on average, they cancel out. All right. so, so mathematically, we're interested in the expectation of a maximum of Gaussian random variables. Now, the, this, this problem has been studied for quite a while in the statistic and probability community. And it's called the uh, extreme value theory. Perhaps some of you have heard about that. Uh, so if you have many, many independent random variables, then we know that their sum is, uh, converges to the Gaussian distribution. But if instead of sum, or the normalized sum, sorry. If instead of sum you take maximum, it doesn't, and you normalize it appropriately, it does not converge in general to uh, the Gaussian distribution, but it has some other limit a distribution, the, the, perhaps the most famous one, it's called the Gumbel distribution, um, for those of you who know. 
But this theory is, holds for independent variables. And uh, like I told you, our variables are not independent. We have this covariance matrix of the siblings. So there is a technical part that we needed to do. So we needed to sort of separate the independent part and the dependent part of these variables. Uh, and that's what's written here. So we can write S as Y plus Z. There's two random variables, two Gaussian random variables. One of them is completely independent. Here we have the, the unit uh, covariance matrix. And the other one is completely dependent, right? So they're all identical. Okay? And you can think of that as, as the part of your genome you share with your siblings and the part that it's to totally independent, right? And, and once you do this decomposition, you can uh, go back and use the known theory for the independent part. And the dependent part doesn't really matter because if it's the same for everybody, then when you select and then you take somebody you didn't who you didn't select for, they cancel out. Right? Um, so that's the idea. There are many details. I'm going to skip them because I want to get to more uh, advanced uh, part of the talk. And eventually we have a, a result based on the Gamble distribution. Um, so this is on expectation how much you gain. So we have the standard deviation of the trait. We have R. So this is, notice it's not R square. It's a square root of R square, which is R. This is, so, the, so the square root of the variance you explain, uh, explained by the, by the polygenic score. And we have some constant here and some uh, uh, values of the, you know, the, the, the cumulative Gaussian distribution. So we have an asymptotic formula for the gain, and notice the dependence on n. So n is the number of embryos. Right? So the more embryos you have, you can gain more uh, on average. OK. Now this is a little bit complicated. You can do asymptotics, and you get a simpler formula, slightly less accurate, but not by much. And, and this tells you really what's going on here. So if you, you know, in the future, if you're going to improve the variance explained by the polygenic scores here, then we can gain more and more by a selection. If we increase the number of viable embryos, we can also gain more, but it grows very slowly. So it grows like square root of log, right? So if you have, instead of two, three, uh, four embryos, we can go to five or 10, it will grow, but you know, it will saturate pretty quickly. All right. uh, is that clear, questions? Okay, now the mean does not tell you the whole story. We also calculated the variance. I, do, I, I will not go into the details. I just wanted to do mention that because I, we found there what I think is a cool mathematical results, which I don't know how to explain. Uh, so if anybody knows, please talk to me. So if you have, you know, when, when, you, when you look at the variance, you, you need to look not just on how things increase on average, but we, you need to look at the pairwise correlations between the variables. And in particular here, because we are maximizing, then we need to look at the correlation of, let's say, one score and the, and the maximal score. And now, uh, maybe some of you know that when you, t when you take a Gaussian random variables and you're asking what is the expectation of the maximum, there is no exact formula. What, what do we know? We have the approximate formula that I've shown you before, the Gamble distribution. But the, you cannot really write an exact formula for the expectation of the maximum. And the same is true for the variance of the maximum. But let's say you're taking the correlation or the, of, of one variable and the maximum, right? So the expectation of the product. So what will that be? Anybody knows? or intuition. So you take n, n, n of random variables and you take the first one and you take the maximum of all of them. And what is the expectation of the product? Sorry? Zero. Uh, no, it's not zero because, you know, the, the maximum might be y1, right? So asymptotically it's zero. When n is very large, it's zero. It, it approaches zero, but it's not exactly zero. One over n. One over n. Very nice. So it turns out it's exactly one over n. Okay. So I think it's, 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 it's not, once you think about this problem, it's not hard to see that it's sort of 
asymptotically goes like 1 over n, but why it's exactly 1 over n, it's a mystery to me. And it's, it holds for Gaussians, it doesn't hold for a general distribution. No, so if is it, I, I don't know why it holds. I mean, for if it's non-Gaussian, it, it's, it's not exactly one over n. All right, so there are some, okay, I, I won't show you the proofs. There are some mathematical arguments that show that, but I don't really have a good intuition why it's exactly one over n. Anyways, that's just a mathematical curiosity. And you can use that and, uh, and, and just do a straightforward uh, calculation of all the covariances. And we also have a formula for the variance. All right. Um, so that's you. Now, why is the variance interesting? I will show you in a minute. Uh, these are just some examples of a, of a simulated trait value. So all I've shown you so far was just based on theory. But why would you believe that the theory is relevant for real data? So we don't really have real data for embryos, right? Because these things are not done routinely. What we took as sort of a validation was looking at either data set where we have data for siblings, right? And then you can look at both the genetic scores, the polygenic scores of the siblings and their phenotype values, or some other forms of validations that some of them will be shown is if you can take genomes of parents and you can simulate from the real genomes the genomes of uh, the children. So for two parents, you can do the following simulation. You, you, you cross their genome and you take into account all the recombination probabilities, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can generate many simulated uh, children. And then you can compare between their scores. All right. Um, Okay, so this is basically what I told you this is shown here. So that's how you simulate. You have the parents and you sort of break their genomes in the recombination, using recombination, and, and that's how you generate one offspring and you can repeat the process and generate many, many offspring. Okay, so now what we, uh, okay, let me just give you the result here. So when you do this simulation, um, you can uh, look at the distribution of the gain. So what I defined before was the average gain. So we had a formula for the expected gain. If you take, if you do embryo selection with a certain number of embryos, here it's 10. So how, what we calculated so far was how much are you going to gain on average for the entire population. But now let's say you, let's say you do it for many, many families. So you get a distribution, which is here, right? So this, this simulation shows you a distribution whose average we calculated before. So there is some variation. So for example, here, if the average is, let's say, two or three centimeters, for some families, it will be much higher. Let's say you can get five or six centimeters. And for other families, it's much less effective, right? So uh, that's important because it might be the case that embryo selection is not so much effective for the entire population on average, but it will still be effective for a certain uh, fraction of families at the tail. Right. Okay, so the numbers we got were, you know, not very impressive, but I still think not negligible. So with some reasonable assumption, about height and, and about uh, IQ points, uh, you can get two to three centimeters or two to three uh, IQ points with a, you know, a reasonable number of embryos. Okay, and these are just some plots that show that our theoretical curves uh, align pretty well with the simulation. So we can uh, skip that. Um, so, you know, you can, once, once you have this machinery, you can play with all kinds of parameters. You can change the number of embryos. You can change the R square. And, uh, and uh, you can see how things behave as a function of the problem parameters. Okay. Now, just the last point I want to make for a single uh, quantitative trait. Uh, the fact that you can increase on average the value of the trait does not really mean that you can predict it accurately. 
because you still have variance, right? So for example, if you look at height of individuals in most uh, European populations, there is a standard deviation of about seven uh, centimeters, right? So if I tell you the average height in the population, it doesn't really tell you what will be the height of a particular individual. And now if I select someone and I tell you, okay, on average, he or she are, let's say, two centimeters taller or shorter than the average, there is still a wide distribution around that. All right, so I want to, to calculate how wide is this distribution. And you can calculate this um, a prediction interval. And, all right, so, okay, you get some formulas. I will not get to the details of how we derive them, but they're not very complicated. And that's an example. So, for example, if we look at the height, which, which has h square of 0.7, and here, we are be, I mean, this is just an example. You can plug in other numbers if you want to the formulas. Uh, if you're optimistic and you have a very good polygenic score that explains 40% of the variance, then, you know, without selection, you can be in this range, which has a width of uh, 20 centimeters, 166 to 186. Now, with selection, uh, you narrow it down to uh, 13 centimeters, right? But notice that the effect we get is non-symmetric, right? So what we got is that the left side of the prediction interval went up by quite a lot, by eight centimeters, but the right side only by one, right? So that's a, and that's a general phenomena that we see. So the effect of selection is non-symmetric, and you can see that here when you when you do some uh, theoretical calculation. So when you take vi independent variables from a Gaussian distribution and you take the maximum, then you get the Gumbel distribution. So you see that the left tail goes quite a lot to the right, but the right tail is not really moving much, right? And so that's, I think, an important lesson. Once you, in retrospect, after you think about it, it's, 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 it's pretty uh, logical. Uh, but maybe, I'll, we, uh, you know, it wasn't clear at least to me in advance. And what it means, at least conceptually, about embryo selection is that people may, might have this view that, you know, you want to, that the selection will give us people at the really, really top of the, of some ability, right? Uh, but that's not really the case. That's hard to achieve. What a selection will be more effective as is sort of eliminating the individuals at the left part of the curve, right? Okay, so that's sort of the consequences of this asymmetry. Okay, any questions? No, all right. Okay, now we're moving to, so I told you there are four parts. There is a quantitative trait, one, and there are multiple quantitative traits, and then we have one disease trait and multiple disease traits. So we are now in the second part. I'm not sure how I'm doing in time. Um, is the clock here? Uh, we're talking about multiple quantitative traits. All right. So for that, we need to also uh, introduce a covariance matrix between the traits. So let's say now we have, instead of one trait, we are selecting for T traits. And we're looking at one individual. So for each individual, we are going to have a vector of these scores. And we also model them as jointly Gaussian with a certain covariance matrix, sigma t. And it's written here. So on the, on the diagonal of this matrix are the R squares that are explained by each, uh, by each polygenic score. But we also have the off-diagonal. These, these things are called genetic correlations. Right? So for those of you who know, these are the things that, for example, a program like LD score regression can estimate for you. So, it's the gen so if you have two phenotypes, you can just calculate their Pearson correlation, but this is a, a correlation of the phenotype, right? It's affected both by genetics and by uh, environment. You can look only at the part of the correlation that is due to genetics, and it's more tricky to estimate, but there are methods that can do that. And it tells you how much are the genetic parts of these two traits correlated, right? So. There are programs, like I said, that can estimate these things for you, and we take them as if they are known. So we suppose that we have these estimates, and the question is again, how will this affect 
how much you can gain do, when you're doing selection. All right. um, so now if you take, you know, so you take the, the traits for an individual, and then you're looking at many individuals, many embryos, right? So you get a matrix of scores, right? So that's a matrix, so we have, a, oh, okay, okay, so it's, 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 you know, it's not like I said, but you have to shift it by, by 90 degrees. So this is one embryo, and this is another, and another, and another, you have a matrix. Now they're all Gaussians, uh, but jointly they have what's called the matrix normal distribution, right? So people know this distribution, who doesn't know? Don't be shy, all right? Okay, so what's a matrix normal distribution? So we all know what's a multivariate normal distribution. We have a vector, and it has a certain covariance matrix, right? Now let's suppose we have a matrix of random variables. Now we can forget that there are, it's a matrix. We can just take the rows and put them one, one after another and get a very, very long vector. And this will also be a jointly Gaussian uh, distribution, right? But the covariance matrix will be huge. Right? Um, so, when you have this metric structure, what it really tells you is that you can write the covariance matrix of all the elements in this matrix using two smaller matrices. So, sigma t, this is a, the, these are the genetic correlation of the traits, and sigma s, these are the kinships, right? So, in a way, it's a, it's, it's a distribution that it can be modeled with fewer parameters, right? So you can sort of, you can build the huge covariance matrix uh, using these two smaller matrices. And technically how it's done, it's called the Kronecker product. So you basically just take one matrix and you duplicate it many, many, many times. And each time you multiply it by another element of the other matrix, right? So that's sort of, I mean, I mean uh, a, a compact way to represent the joint distribution and there are also elegant ways to do calculation with that without really ever storing or, co or computing the entire huge matrix, right? So you save here parameters and you also save computation. All right. Um, and that's pretty common in genetics and also in phylogenetics uh, when you're looking at multiple traits using this uh, model. All right. So now let's say we want to select for multiple continuous traits. So the question is, what are we selecting for? So if you are selecting for linear combination of the traits, then things are quite simple. So let's say you have five traits and you are saying, okay, this one is very important, so I'll give it a weight of 0.5. This one not so much, so it's 0.05, et cetera, et cetera. So you, so you have a vector of weights that tells you which ones are more important and less important. So that's the, the W. Then you can sort of define your weighted trait, your super trait if you want. So you're just a linear combination of your traits. And then, because everything is linear, you're going back to the case of the one trait, right? So if you want, let's say, 50% height and 20% cholesterol and 30% intelligence or whatever, you just sum them up and you sort of define your new traits that you want to select for. And the distribution you get is the function of the distributions of the original traits. And other than that, everything is going back to the previous calculations we've done, right? So you define your W, your vector of weights. This is your new, the distribution of your new traits. And you get this uh, formula. Uh, again, everything depends on uh, the weight vector you, you've chosen and importantly, the covariance matrix between the traits. Right. And you can, I mean, I will not get into the uh, mathematical details, but intuitively, you can think what's going on here. If, if this covariance matrix is mainly positive, so, so imagine you have a covariance matrix of genetic correlation and they are all positive, maybe even very strongly positive. In terms of selection, that's good because when you increase one phenotype, you will also increase the other one, right? So you're selecting for all of them together. On the other hand, if you have many negative values in the covariance matrix, so you, you have this trade-off. So if you increase one of them, the other one will go down. So you cannot really improve a lot when you're doing this selection. And this, technically, it all goes into this calculation here, but that's really the case. So the, the more positive correlation we have between the phenotypes, the more we can gain when we're doing selection.
for multiple phenotypes. All right. Uh, so that's what you got here. You can also ask, okay, suppose that you selected for the linear combination, how much did you gain for, let's say, just height or just, or just uh, HDL or whatever, so you can get formulas for that. Okay, and that's all summarizing the paper here. And now I want to move to the second part, which is disease traits. So, any questions? Yes, and just maybe, I have a question. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good comment. So I'm I'm making here many simplifying assumptions, and it is correct that if you have your SNP uh, uh, data, you, it's better to actually compute the kinship based on the SNP, maybe using IBD segments, and then you can get improved kinship values, right? But they're really quite close to what I'm showing here. So this this can be a sort of as a first order estimation of what you can get. All right. So for diseases, okay. So not much time, um, uh, uh, so, I, uh, so I, will, I will just show you what we do for one disease and also an important, an important issue which is how do you integrate the information about the parents, which I didn't talk about yet. And I will skip the part about multiple diseases. All right. So for disease we use the standard model that we were using, it's called the liability threshold model and that's basically saying Okay, you have a binary variable that tells you are you, are you sick or healthy, but we are, also, we are always dealing with continuous scores, Gaussian scores, so you need some transformation from the Gaussian score to the binary one. And a popular one is a liability threshold model, basically it's saying you have some score, hidden score liability, and if it passes a certain threshold, then you're sick. Right? So that's a, that's a very well-known uh, model in quantitative genetics. Um, and now, basically, what we've done is we took this model and applied the calculations from before, but uh, now we're asking not how much will the continuous uh, variable increase, but how does the probability of increasing the threshold change when you're doing the selection. Um, and you can get some formulas. So this is, for example, the probability of disease uh, if you are doing selection. Right, so it depends on the variance explained by the score, uh, on n, the number of embryos, and you get some formula, and you should compare that to the baseline probability. And the baseline probability is called the prevalence, the prevalence of the disease in the population, and you can ask what is the relative gain, so, you're, so it's, sort of, it's one minus the ratio, right? So if you didn't improve, then it will be zero, but if you decreased this probability, this is, let's say, let's say you decrease it from k to k over 3, right? So you, reduces, you reduced the disease probability threefold, so we'll have here a two-third, right? So it's your relative improvement is, is two-third. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip all of that. This is describing our simulations. And uh, these are the results, so again, they show that our mathematical model aligns with the simulation. And what you see here is the relative risk reduction on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is um, the different things, uh, for example, I mean, let's forget about the left part, but on the, on the right side it's the number of embryos you're using. So you see this increase with the number of embryos, but like expected, it saturates really quickly. But what's important here is that for realistic R-squares, you can get substantial relative uh, risk reduction. So let's say you have a bad disease, so 25 or 50 percent reduction, that could be a big deal, right? Um, okay, so in some sense, the results we get for disease are more impressive than for quantitative traits, and that's because even if you shift your continuous distribution a little bit, when you look at the, at the tail, at the threshold, you can really, really increase or decrease the probability that you pass the tail. Right. 
So uh, that's, that's sort of one main important point, that for disease it seems to be more effective than for qualitative traits. And I'm going to skip this slide and I'm going to make the last point, which is now suppose that you want to condition on the parents. So it could be the case that you have some disease and maybe you don't want to screen for that because it's rare and there are many, many other traits and like we said, it's very hard to screen for many of them together. So from the majority of the population, selection will not be effective for this disease. But suppose that you have a family such with, with some history of this disease in the family, right? So then for this family, the probability of the embryo having the disease is substantially increased. So it might make sense to screen or do selection only for this particular disease, right? So for example, let's say you have a family with schizophrenia, uh, let's say one of the parents or many other relatives, then maybe you would want to screen the embryo just for schizophrenia for this family. And the question is, well, conditional on the parent disease status, how will selection be, how effective will selection be? Will it be as good as in the general population or much worse or maybe better? So that's what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to do the same calculation we did before, but instead of averaging over the entire population, we are conditioning on the disease status of the parents. Uh, and we're going to see how does this uh, absolute or relative risk rejection change with this conditioning. And the, there are many, I have like a, a few slides about how to do this calculation that I'm not going to go into, uh, but here are the results. So it turns out that relative risk reduction is not strongly affected by disease status of the parents. So here we have an example. We have a disease with prevalence of 1%, and we can divide the families into three parts. So uh, families where uh, both parents are healthy, one parent is diseased, and uh, both parents are diseased. And what's plotted on the y-axis is a relative risk reduction. And you see it's pretty much the same, it doesn't change much, it goes slightly lower. But what's important is not the relative risk reduction, but the absolute risk reduction. So for example, here you reduce from 0.9% to let's say, if you are let's say here at 50, you reduce this to 0.5%, right? So the absolute risk reduction is not great. Uh, but here you can reduce it from almost 7% to let's say 3 or 4%. And here from 30% to maybe 15 or, 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 I don't know, maybe 20%, right? So it seems that in terms of absolute risk reduction, it could be quite beneficial in some cases to do this selection uh, for uh, affected families. All right, so that's the bottom line. That's, there are many details about how to calculate that. You need to, uh, take, you need to take the disease status of the parents and this conditional on this disease status, this changes the conditional distribution of the score of the parents. So you need to calculate that, integrate over that, and then uh, calculate the conditional uh, uh, risk of both the selected embryo and of a random embryo. And you're doing many Gaussian integrals, and that's how we've done it, right? So given the time, I will stop here. I'll just mention this paper uh, that deals with that. And the current work we're doing is trying to extend that to multiple diseases. Right. Uh, okay, so I'm done. I'm skipping here. If anybody's interested, you can uh, talk to me later. We have uh, uh, an R, uh, R code that can calculate many of the things I've shown you here. Um, we have some empirical evidence about something I talk about. I mean, not us, but it's from papers that appeared recently that shows that for most, re most diseases, at least, that people are looking at, you see that most correlations are positive, right? So that's a good news in terms of selection because it means that you will not have many cases like here, like here that you're going to select from one trait and do really bad in, in another trait. All right, so let me stop here. There are many ethical and technical caveats that I'm going to skip, and I just want to thank the people who did the work. So. I'm here, so I'm talking about that, but this project was really led by Shai Karmi uh, from the Hebrew U and by Todd Lentz. And the, the quantitative paper was by all these people on the left, and especially Oud Karavani. 
and the disease paper, the people on the right, and especially Daniel Bankers. And like everybody else, we are looking for students. Uh, Jerusalem is great. Uh, and talk to me. Okay, thank you.